There is power, there's power Here in this hour, this hour We're all together, together That's a great way to start off the morning. Amen? You can have a seat for just a second. I am Mary Beth Poor, and I just want to welcome all of you to worship at Mountaintop today. And we love having everybody in the room, and I also want to say hello to those of you who are worshiping online with us this morning. It's so cool to think that every single Sunday we have people who come and participate online in worship all around the world. And so we're so glad to have you be a part. And also, speaking of around the world, we have a team who is supposed to be in the Philippines by now, um, but they missed their connection flight, and they're stuck in Tokyo. And I'm sure the high schoolers are loving it, okay? I'm sure if if your child is uh, in Tokyo, they probably have pictures all over Facebook of a Tokyo hotel. So they may be joining us right now on their phones, but just pray that they make it safely to the Philippines and are able to do the ministry that God's called them to do there. And hey, if you're new or visiting with us this morning, we just want to say we're so glad that you chose to come and be a part of our church today. And we would love to know a little bit more about you. So hopefully you got a program when you walked into um, the sanctuary. And half of that is just for you to fill out um, the welcome half, um, just to tell us a little bit more information about who you are. And you can either drop it in the offering bucket when it is passed later on in the service, or you can hang on to it and visit our starting point corner, which is in the atrium, where we would love to give you a gift as a thank you for coming today. And then the other half is for every single one of us, just to give you a little bit more information about the things and events that we have going on at Mountaintop, and we want to keep you updated about that. 
So in case you have not gotten a chance to speak to anyone, in case you ran into the sanctuary, I would love to give you a chance to say hello. So stand up, find someone you haven't spoken to today, and tell them how good they look. Glad you're here.
you speak the word and I am running into your home Cause I have seen your life, you bring my world to life I'm coming after your love
you can have a seat if you would. Uh, in just a few moments, our ushers are going to come forward, and it is a time in the service that we get to give back to God out of the blessings that he has given to us. But one of the things that we love to do each week before we do that is to share with you a story of how those gifts are being used to help fulfill God's vision of learning and sharing a better way to live. And I am here with Melissa Sanderson, who directs our children's ministry. And last week, this room was... People are cheering for you. You have a fan club right, right here. Uh, last week, this room was packed full with kids, and we had vacation Bible school. And it was an incredible week of laughing and loving and learning. Uh, Our kids learned about how sweet it is to be loved by God. Uh, Sometimes they got those lessons a little bit slowly. One little boy told his mom, he's seven, and she asked him what had happened that day. And he said, I learned that Zacchaeus climbed a tree to get high so he could see God. And uh, that's not exactly the way we taught the story. Um, He got most of it right. But it was an incredible week. Uh, We want to celebrate it this morning, and we have a short video to help us do that. So take a look at the screens on the sides. It, it really was an incredible week, and I asked Melissa earlier today uh, if you had one highlight to share with us from the week, what would that be? Well, we separated out our fourth and fifth graders this year, and um, I got to sit in on, um, we shared the gospel with them one day, and I got to sit on, on that talk, and we had 10 kids receive Christ that day on Amen. Wednesday. So really cool. Um, and, and those kids' lives have been changed forever, and the lives of so many other kids and families are changed because last week they discovered how sweet it is to be loved by God. And your gifts help to make that possible. And so as our ushers come forward this morning and we give back to God, um, know that he takes those gifts and he uses them to make ministries like Vacation Bible School and and mission teams in the Philippines and so much else that is happening here on the mountain as we get off the mountain. Those gifts are used to make all of that possible. And when you give, lives are being transformed. 
And so give joyfully, give expectantly. Now, if you're a guest worshiping with us today, it is absolutely okay just to let the bucket go by. But if you're a part of the Mountaintop family, we would encourage you to give and to invest in what God is doing as we advance his kingdom. Let's continue to worship as we present our morning offering. Your majesty, may we come closer, you're all we need, above any other my eyes have seen, gazed at your splendor. Here comes our King, our voices get louder, we rise to sing, the anthem of power, just to be part of
Would you pray with me? Lord, that's our prayer, that you would come and you'd move in our lives, you'd take over our thoughts, you'd set aside our pride. Lord, that you would take over everything that we have and everything that we are. And as we offer these gifts back to you, as we return to you, just a part of the blessings that you've entrusted to us, Lord, we ask you to take them and to bless them, multiply them, use them to make your love and your name and your life known in vacation Bible schools and in the Philippines and in ministries here on this mountain and in ministries off this mountain across the city and around the world. And Lord, we pray that you would be very near to us now as we open your word. Would you open our hearts to truths that you would teach us? For we ask that in Christ's name and we ask it for his glory alone. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we are picking up again a series that uh, we are uh, engaged in this summer that we are uh, week by week working our way through the Old Testament book of Daniel. And we're doing a chapter a week and and really kind of working through it verse by verse. And we are on chapter four this week. So go ahead, if you would, find a Bible. And if you you don't have a Bible with you, you can always pick one up when you come in the door in the back. Uh, Get out a Bible or get out your iPad or your phone or whatever you have the Bible on. If you're watching online, there's a little tab you can click up there up in the upper right hand corner. And go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter four. And as you're finding that, let me just kind of catch you up on where we are over the first three chapters. Uh, Daniel, you might remember, is a book that was written to the nation of Israel during a time that they are living in exile. The Babylonians, under King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies, have come and they have uh, conquered Israel. They have destroyed Jerusalem. They have taken most of Israel and all of the leaders into captivity in Babylon. And the book of Daniel is written to a people who have begun to wonder if God has forgotten all about them. And it's a great book for us when we face seasons in our life when maybe things aren't working out exactly the way that we had hoped or exactly the way that we had planned. And we sometimes have the same question. We start to wonder if maybe God has forgotten all about us. Daniel is written to give Israel and to give us hope that God is still in control. Uh, Week one, you you might remember, we learned this truth that God is in control in spite of our present condition. Uh, And that's good news when sometimes it seems like life is out of control. Uh, In chapter two, we discovered that God sees in the dark and that light spills out of him. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we looked at chapter 3, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being tossed into the furnace. And we were reminded that our God is able. And sometimes he delivers us from the furnace, but sometimes he meets us in the furnace. But he's always able to save us. And this week, we're going to get to uh, to chapter 4. And chapter 4 is focused on the king of Babylon, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And we have been introduced to Nebuchadnezzar in the first three chapters. Uh, He hasn't had a major role to play, but we've learned a little bit about him. Uh, In chapter 1, you you get to the very end of chapter 1, and Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that Daniel and his three friends, who he names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, that they they have no equal in all of Babylon. In fact, he says they are ten times better than anyone else, and he places them in important positions in his government. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Daniel's really the center of the story because only Daniel has the ability and the courage to be able to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And when you get to the very end of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar makes this claim about Daniel's God. He says, I am now certain that your God, Daniel, your God is the God of all gods, the Lord of all kings, and the revealer of mysteries. And in chapter 3, after throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace and God rescuing there, Nebuchadnezzar is again confronted with the power of God. And he ends the chapter by saying, praise is certainly due the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No other God I have ever heard of is able to rescue as this God is has rescued his servants today. And so in these first three chapters, Nebuchadnezzar has had encounters with the God of Israel, but they've always been things that have happened to somebody else. 
is someone else who is being given special abilities or someone else who is being rescued. But in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar becomes the center of the story. And he has a personal encounter with the God of Israel and it changes his life. And chapter 4 is his testimony about that encounter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through chapter 4 pretty much verse by verse. And so we're just going to do a little bit of Bible study this morning. And I want to ask you, will you stay with me while we do that? You promise? You sure? All right, so here we go. Verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. One day King Nebuchadnezzar sent out a herald with a message for all the peoples, nations, and languages of the earth. Now kind of right off the bat, Nebuchadnezzar wants to make sure that everybody in the entire world Here's his testimony. And so he sends a messenger out to the very ends of the earth, to all the people, nations, and languages of the earth. And this is what the message says. May peace and prosperity be yours. I am pleased to be able to tell you about all the signs and miracles the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how powerful are his miracles. His kingdom will endure. His reign will last from generation to generation. And then in the verses that follow, Nebuchadnezzar proceeds to tell us how it is that he has come to this understanding. That the God of Israel is the one whose kingdom will endure, whose reign is going to last from generation to generation. The story begins about 20 years after he had tossed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace. And Babylon at this point is kind of at its height of power. All the surrounding nations have been conquered. All of their riches and treasures have been brought into Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has built this incredible city, an an, an awesome palace, a temple. The hanging gardens that he built became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, He has built this impressive city, uh, and he's kind of impressed with himself. And so you get to verse 4, and this is what he says. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, and things were going well. You always kind of got to worry when someone makes a statement like that. Things were going well, and I was prospering. Life is good, and life is comfortable. But but Nebuchadnezzar is about to learn a truth about God. And uh, and this is an important truth for us. God will always comfort the disturbed. And, And that's good news when we're disturbed. God will comfort the disturbed, but God will also disturb the comfortable. And Nebuchadnezzar has grown too comfortable. And everything's about to change. Verse 5. Then one night I had a dream that terrified me. As I rested that night on my bed, the images in my mind, the visions in my head, they disturbed me greatly and I could not shake the fear. Now, if you're the king and you're terrified, the only thing to do is to send for advisors to tell you what's going on with this dream. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar does. Verse 6. So I ordered my servants to gather all the wise men of Babylon and bring them before me in order to tell me what this dream might mean. And so they came, magicians, enchanters, Chaldean astrologers and diviners. And, I, and though I told them the dream, remember in chapter 2 he tried to make them guess the dream? This time he tells them the dream. And though I told them the dream, they could not tell me its meaning. All the wisdom of the palace wasn't enough. And so Nebuchadnezzar sends for Daniel, verse 8. So finally Daniel came to me. This man had been given the Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, after the name of my own god, Bel. Name meant protector of the king. And it certainly seems the spirit of the holy gods is with him. And I told him my dream. Nebuchadnezzar knows that Daniel has the ability, he's seen this uh, lived out in the past, that Daniel has the ability to interpret dreams. And so Nebuchadnezzar has confidence that Daniel can interpret this dream. And so finally we get to hear the dream. Uh, that has Nebuchadnezzar so worked up. Starts in verse 10. It says, here's the dream. A tree stood in the middle of the land. It was huge, rising high in the sky. And the tree grew tall and strong, and it reached right up to the top of the sky. It was so large that it could be seen from one end of the earth to the other. It had beautiful leaves and plenty of fruit. In fact, it provided sustenance for everyone. Wild animals came and rested in its cool shade. 
Birds flew in and built nests on its sturdy branches. Every living creature plucked its fruit and was satisfied. And Nebuchadnezzar probably recognizes that he is obviously the tree, right? I mean, because what other kingdom stretches from one end of the earth to the other and can be seen by everyone? And who is at the center of that kingdom but Nebuchadnezzar himself? So this first part of the vision, this first part of the dream, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be going, that's me, I'm the tree. I'm the beautiful, powerful, tall one that everyone can see that is providing for everyone. But then the vision takes a twist down in verse 13. And, uh, and this is the part that is uh, going to terrify him. He says, but that's not all. The visions kept coming as I lay there on my bed. And I saw a heavenly messenger, a holy watcher, coming down from heaven. And he shouted out orders regarding the tree. Cut down the tree. Lop off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let all the wild animals beneath it run away, and all the birds on its branches fly away. But leave the stump intact, its roots in the ground, strapped down with iron and bronze, surrounded by the tender grass of the field. Let the dew of heaven fall heavy on it every night and make it wet. In this part of the world, and this is still true today, the, the temperature variations between nighttime and daytime are so great that there is an enormously heavy dew Every morning. Um, and now we start to understand why Nebuchadnezzar is afraid. What, what it is about this vision that terrifies him. If he's the tree, well now the tree's going to get cut down and the branches lobbed off and the leaves stripped and the fruit scattered. And that doesn't sound like a very good thing to happen. And, and then the vision switches from talking about the symbol of a tree to talking about Nebuchadnezzar specifically. Look how verse 15 continues says, and let him, it's not talking about a tree anymore, now it's let him, let him live off the plants of the earth among the wild animals, let his human heart be changed, exchanged for the heart of a wild animal, until seven times have come and gone. The verdict comes down as the watchers decree, the sentence is passed by the order of the holy ones, so that all who live on the earth may know that the most high God is the true sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. He grants authority to anyone he wishes and installs the lowliest of peoples into positions of power. So here's the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar turns to Daniel and he says, Daniel, you know, what, what does it mean? Verse 18, this dream, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, dream, the vision I saw, says, Daniel, none of the other sages and wise men in my kingdom are able to tell me what it means, but I believe you can. Because the, holy, the spirit of the holy gods is with you and you have a special gift. And tell me what it means. And Daniel understands what the dream means pretty quickly. I mean, it's, it's kind of an obvious dream, vision that's being laid out here. But Daniel also has a track record with Nebuchadnezzar. And he knows that the king has a short fuse, a kind of a quick temper, and is likely to fly off into a furious rage when he gets bad news. He has a history of shooting the messenger. And so Daniel's not sure that he's quite ready to share this vision with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, verse 19 says that the interpretation of the king's dream as it became clear, Daniel became visibly upset for a while. His thoughts troubled him because he's sitting there thinking, man, if I tell him about this, I am going into the furnace. And, uh, and I'm not sure God's going to do two rescues there. It just may not happen. And Nebuchadnezzar notices this. Notices this. So he tells Daniel, don't let my dream or his meaning alarm you. Tell me what you know. And so Daniel begins. So the first thing he does is he kind of softens the blow. You know when you need to share some bad news with someone, you, you kind of begin by you know, looking at them and go, man, you look great today. Have you lost weight? I mean, you are having a good hair day. That, that works with uh, one of our teaching pastors really well, if you tell her that. Um, and you are having a great hair day. I just thought I'd tell you. Uh, Daniel kind of, he softens up uh, Nebuchadnezzar a little bit. Verse 20. He says, this tree you saw in your vision... That one that's so tall and strong. That one where the top reached the sky and could be seen from one end of the earth to the other. The tree whose leaves are beautiful and the fruit plentiful. The one that provides sustenance for everyone. 
that tree under which the wild animals are coming to rest and, and in the shade and where the birds are building their nests and the sturdy branches. Well, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, that tree is you. I mean, you should feel good about that, right? You're that tree. But I got some bad news for you. All this stuff about destroying the tree and cutting it down and lopping off the branches and scattering the fruit, yeah, that, that's going to happen too. That, that, that's going to happen to you. Verse 24, he says, here's the interpretation, O king. Here's the decree the Most High God has issued against you, my Lord and King. You're going to be driven away from all that is human and live in the company of wild animals. You'll be forced to eat grass like an oxen, and night after night the dew of heaven will fall on you and make you soaking wet. And seven times will pass until you learn your lesson and acknowledge that it is the Most High God and no other who is the true sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth. And he grants authority to anyone he wishes. The watcher's order to leave the stump and the roots of the tree intact means that your kingdom will be restored to you when and only when you acknowledge that heaven alone is sovereign over the earth. Now you would think a king given those kind of options, acknowledge that heaven alone is sovereign over the earth or go live like an ox, that it'd be a pretty easy choice for him to make. But kings who get impressed with themselves have a tendency to think that they are in control of any and every situation. And, uh, and that's going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Daniel, before, before uh, he goes on, Daniel makes this really bold move. And it's a great model for us. You know, we have a vision as a church to be a place where we are learning and sharing a better way to live in Christ. And Daniel makes a bold move and he offers Nebuchadnezzar some advice. He shares with him, here's a better way. Here, here's a way to avoid this outcome. Uh, look at verse 27. He says, King, please accept my advice to you. Make a clean break with your sins. Invest in what is right. Bring an end to your wicked deeds. Show mercy to those you have beaten down. If you do, if you do, perhaps your future will be different and your prosperity will continue. And again, Nebuchadnezzar has a choice to make here. And it seems to us to be a pretty obvious choice. But look at what happens, verse 28. But King Nebuchadnezzar forgot Daniel's advice. So everything Daniel had predicted happened. Twelve months later, a year goes by. Twelve months later, as the king was strolling across the roof of his royal palace in Babylon, the king uttered foolish words. You ever said foolish words? It's like as soon as they're out of your mouth, you wish you hadn't said them. Uh, this is Nebuchadnezzar. The king utters foolish words. He says to himself, isn't Babylon great? Isn't this a great city? And let's look, pay close attention to this next part. I have built this royal residence from the ground up with my own might and my ingenuity for my own glory. Nebuchadnezzar is very impressed with himself. It's his might and his ingenuity for his glory. It's the sort of foolish pride that is almost always followed by a wake-up call. And that's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 31. The words had scarcely left his lips. Isn't that cool? The words had scarcely left his lips when another voice thundered from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar. That's what the voice sounded like, in case you're wondering. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar, these solemn words are for you. The kingdom has been taken from you right now, right this minute, just instantly. You'll be driven away from all that is human. You will live in the company of wild animals. You'll be forced to eat grass like an oxen. Seven times will pass until you learn your lesson and acknowledge that it is the most high God and no other who is the true sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth. And he grants authority to anyone he wishes. And instantly the heavenly decree against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from all that is human, began to eat grass as oxen do. The dew of heaven fell and drenched his body. In time, his hair grew as long as the feathers on an eagle, and his nails grew as long and curled back on his hand like the claws of a bird. Uh, there's a psychological condition called um, lycanthropy. 
And uh, and evidently, King George III of of England suffered this condition. And uh, those who suffer, it's a form of mental illness. And those who suffer it literally believe that they are an animal. And, uh, and today, if that happens to someone, there are places we can send them to get help and hospitals and institutions. But in Nebuchadnezzar's day, if someone was to suffer a condition like that, uh, there was nowhere to send them, no institution to put them in. They would just be driven away from everybody else, just kind of driven away from society and, and, and put out on their own. And that's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He's just driven away from, from all human contact. And just kind of imagine this for a moment. In one moment, he is standing on the roof of the palace of of maybe the greatest empire that had been built up until that day. And in the next moment, he is living as an ox eating grass out in the field. And he stays there for seven years. The text says, and it goes on until seven times past. Seven in Hebrew is the number for completion. And so what Daniel is trying to say here is he's going to stay in this condition until he learns the lesson completely. And here's the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn. And it's a lesson for all of us. It's in verse 32. He needed to discover that the Most High God and no other is the true sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and he grants authority to anyone he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn this truth about God. But after the time of completion has come come to be fulfilled, he does, he gets it. Look look at verse, uh, verse 34. It says, when the days of exile came to an end, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I looked up toward heaven and I came to my senses. And I blessed the Most High God and praised and gave glory to the one who lives eternally. And then he has this beautiful, beautiful prayer of praise. He says, his reign will endure forever. His kingdom will last from generation to generation. Among all the people of the earth, there are none who can pair. He does as he wishes with the armies of heaven and those who live on the earth. And no one can stop his hand from acting. No one dares to ask, what have you done? And just as Daniel had promised, when he comes to that realization, everything is restored. Look at verse 36. It was in that moment that I came to my senses, and soon my honor and splendor were restored as Daniel predicted, and the former glory of my kingdom returned. And those who had served me before, my advisors and officials, they sought me and returned to the throne of Babylon. In time, my kingdom and power grew even greater than it was before. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, acknowledge the true king of heaven. I praise, lift up, and glorify him because all he does is true, all his ways are just, and he is able to cut down those who strut about in their pride. And the story of Nebuchadnezzar comes to an end. It's the last time we see him in the book of Daniel. Now, some Old Testament scholars, they, they believe, they, uh, some believe that, that Nebuchadnezzar comes to a saving faith in the God of Israel. And his testimony here, it's a beautiful testimony. I acknowledge the true king of heaven. I praise him. I lift him up. I glorify him. All he does is true. His ways are just. He cuts down those in pride. I mean, he, he certainly begins to understand this. Uh, some scholars disagree. I mean, he doesn't send the, the people of Israel back home. He doesn't release the Jews from captivity. He doesn't return all the temple treasures that he has stolen. He doesn't devote the rest of his life to studying the Torah and following God's way. I mean, none of that shows up. All we know for sure about him is that his future glory was more prosperous than his past glory, and he gets to be king again, and he really likes being king, and, uh, and that he has learned an important lesson. And again, this is the lesson that we want to take away from, from chapter 4. He has discovered that the Most High God and no other, no kingdom of earth, no king of earth, the Most High God and no other is the one true sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth, and he is the one who grants authority to whoever he wishes. And that's the lesson that is important for us because it's tempting. It's tempting sometimes to imagine, especially when things are going well, to imagine that we've got everything under control, 
and to start to become impressed with our own power and our own ingenuity and, and maybe make things a little too much about us. It's tempting to, to get focused on the kingdoms of you and the kingdoms of me. And it's tempting sometimes when, when life isn't going well to, to believe that evil has the upper hand. That the evil empires of this world and throughout history we have faced evil empire after evil empire. And there are parts of the world today where it looks like evil has the upper hand. And it it appears that the world is just falling apart and that that evil is going to have the final say. It's tempting to believe that, that God's not in control in those places. And it's tempting. It's just so tempting to become impressed with the kingdoms and authorities and the rulers of this world. But the message of Daniel 4 is so simple. And it's it's simply this. God is sovereign over human kings and earthly kingdoms. No matter how tempting it might be to believe otherwise, Daniel 4 reminds us that God is sovereign over human kings and earthly kingdoms. 600 years after Nebuchadnezzar has this revelation, uh, God demonstrates this truth in a way that changed human history forever. Jesus was arrested by a ruler by the name of Pilate. And Pilate, like Nebuchadnezzar, imagined that the kingdom that he served had all the power and all the might and all the ingenuity and nothing in the world could compare to the power of the Roman Empire. But Pilate wanted to to be sure that he understood uh, this man who stood before him. And so he asked Jesus, he says, they tell me that you are the king of the Jews. Is that true? Are are you the king? And Jesus responded this way. In John 19, Jesus said, my kingdom is not recognized in this world. If this were my kingdom, my servants would be fighting for my freedom. But my kingdom is not in this physical realm. You say that I am a king? For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the cosmos, to demonstrate the power of truth. And everyone who seeks truth hears my voice. But not everyone seeks truth, and and Pilate wasn't seeking truth, he's just seeking power. And so Jesus is executed, nailed on a cross. And it appears, it appears that evil has carried the day. That evil has had the last word. That, that evil is sovereign over, the, over human lives. But God is sovereign over human kings and earthly kingdoms. God is sovereign over heaven and earth. And the cross isn't the end of the story. The story continues with an empty tomb and a resurrected king. And we discover that what began on the cross was God's plan to bring his people out of exile. You see, the people of Israel had been in exile, in captivity in Babylon. We were in exile, in captivity to sin. And God says, that's not the end of the story because I am sovereign over human kings and kingdoms. I am sovereign over heaven and earth. And on the cross, I have begun a rescue plan to restore creation. And at the end of the story, in in, in Revelation, the last book in the Bible, says this, at the end of the story, the kingdom of the world will give way to the kingdom of our Lord and his anointed one. Nebuchadnezzar had said that his, king would, his kingdom would be established forever and forever from generation to generation. Revelation says the kingdom of the world will give way to the kingdom of our Lord, of his anointed one, and he will rule throughout the ages. And so here's what we need to take away from this. Here, here's what we need to remember. Sometimes when we're tempted to get comfortable because life is going really well, And to start to become impressed with ourselves and and the things that we are doing, we need to remember that God still comforts the disturbed and he will disturb the comfortable. And that he is sovereign over the kingdoms of you and, and of me. And then during those times when we feel as if the world, the the kingdoms of this world and the evil in this world is just overwhelming and insurmountable, we need to remember that God is sovereign over human kings and earthly kingdoms. God is sovereign over heaven and earth. He's sovereign over your life. He's sovereign over my life. He is sovereign over this church 
and over our nation and all the nations of the world. He just speaks a word, word and, and rulers and, and nations are disposed of. And that he is at work establishing his kingdom of life and love and righteousness and peace. And it starts right here in our hearts and it spreads out into all the world. And that's good news. That's good news. So would you pray with me? Lord, in those moments when we are tempted to be overwhelmed by earthly kings and earthly kingdoms and evil that confronts us and and life appears to be overwhelming. Lord, would you remind us, as, uh, as we've seen in Daniel 4, that you are sovereign. Lord, that you are in control of kings and kingdoms of heaven and earth. And that at the end of the story, your kingdom of justice and righteousness and peace will be established. And it will be a kingdom that will live from generation to generation, a kingdom that will endure forever. And as we go out into this week, Lord, we pray that you might help us be bearers of that kingdom. And the places where we live and work and play, Lord, may we be your kingdom agents, proclaiming to all of the world that you are in control. And that your kingdom, your kingdom will prevail. We pray that all. We do it in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me if you would for just a moment. Uh, As you leave this morning, next week we're going to be in chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at a great story about some writing that appears on the wall. And uh, so it'll be a good week to be back. You want to read chapter 5 kind of in preparation for next Sunday. It'd be a great thing to do. Encourage you to bring a friend. Uh, This Wednesday night, we're going to be starting a summer series doing apologetics and just going deeper into why we believe what we believe. And that's Wednesday evenings at 630 uh, right here on campus. Encourage you to come and to be a part of that as well. Uh, Mary Beth mentioned this earlier, but if you're a guest with us today, we would love for you to visit our starting point ministry. People there who could tell you a little bit more about how things are, what's going on here at Mountaintop, about how you can be involved. And finally, if you came here today and and you just brought with you a a burden and and maybe it's just weighing on you and something is just kind of heavy in your life and you'd like someone to pray with you and uh, we've got a prayer team that meets right over here in the prayer corner as soon as the service is over. And there are people there who would love to, to spend some time praying with you and praying for you. And as we go forth from here, the good news is that we never leave here alone. But our living Lord Jesus Christ, he always goes with us. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you his way, now and forevermore. Amen. For those of you watching online today, we are so glad that you're part of Mount Top's online community. We hope that you'll come and visit us in person. And we really hope that you have a great 4th of July, a blessed week, and that you will discover that God is sovereign in your life and everything that you do this week. We'll see you next Sunday. Take care. Waking or sleeping, your presence, my life.